to this uh, March 1st edition of the Courier Paper Boys. Look outside and see a little snow. It's uh, got to be March in Iowa, state tournament time. Uh, I'm Sports Editor Doug Newhoff, and I'm joined this morning by um, our uh, all-conference team of uh, Jim Sullivan to my left and Jim Nelson to my right. Um, let's start with a little college basketball, guys. Um, Iowa State won a big game last night over Oklahoma State, 58-50. Um, Cyclones are now 21-9, and they wrap up their season Saturday uh, at Kansas, which certainly won't be easy. I watched a little of the Kansas game last night while I was working, and they were really impressive. Um, it was a little different style of game last night for the Cyclones. Um, does that tell us anything about uh, what's going on there going forward? It's an interesting question. I don't know. My sense of it was is that, there, that that senior night might have been a little bit of a distraction, that they weren't really totally in tune. They missed a lot of shots. Uh, and give Oklahoma State a lot of credit. Uh, they were very shorthanded, yet managed to scrap, hang in there. Uh, you know, played well to give themselves a chance. There's one other odd thing, <coughs> excuse me, about the game last night was that Monte Morris really wasn't very aggressive for whatever reason. It's certainly not, he only took a couple of shots, scored two points, and that's a little out, out of character for him. And they're really going to uh, going to need him going forward. Uh, the other interesting thing uh, about it, and piece of trivia, that's. Iowa State, the last time Iowa State scored 58 points in a game and won was six years ago uh, in the, uh, at the end of the Greg McDermott era. So it doesn't happen very often there. Um, at, what, on a character night, or they, they may have to win some games like this down the road, especially in the NCAA tournament, but uh, it's certainly not the sort of game you'd expect to see from Iowa State. No, they're usually up in the 90s. And, right. Uh, for them to be in the 50s, I mean, at times it did look like they were trying to kind of dictate the tempo a little bit more and slow the game down, but then at other times they'd get out and go, so I really didn't get a feel I guess from that, for what they're trying to get done there. But, uh, maybe you're right, it was just kind of a, a different type of a game with uh, the way it was played out and the way Oklahoma State played. Certainly, uh, and, and you uh, implied this, that it's gonna, that's not going to work very well down in Lawrence on, on Saturday. Yeah. <coughs> Excuse me, especially Kansas played last night. It was, I was very much surprised by that. Not so much that Kansas won, but they just blew Texas out of the water at home. Uh, in their last home game, and you would have thought that the Longhorns would give them a little more of a battle, but it, uh, it was saying they ended up being 15 to nothing to start the game, something like that, and it didn't get much better from there. So Iowa State's going to finish in the middle of the pack in the Big 12, and we know that. Um, uh, can they go win the Big 12 tournament? Yes, but uh, <laughs> it's going to take uh, a couple of things. One, uh, I think, and we talked about this all year, defense. They, got, they have to play good defense. At times they do, at other times they don't. I've said this before, they have trouble, trouble closing out on three-point shooters. Last night, at times, it looked disorganized defensively. They really didn't know like they, like they had a plan out there. It's <clears throat> striking, especially when you uh, compare them to a, a UNI team, a Ben Jacobson team, where the rotations are not always perfect, but they're a lot more precise than, than what we tend to see from Iowa State. Uh, George Yang cannot get in foul trouble. Uh, that's, he's got to stay on the floor. Monte Morris has got to be more aggressive. And then you have to have someone from the quote-unquote supporting cast help out. Uh, uh, whether it's Nader or, or someone else. And uh, Jameel McKay also has to be consistent. He cannot uh, be in and out. If he's in and out somewhere along the line, that in the Big 12 tournament, Iowa State will be out. And you've got to win multiple games against really quality teams right. in that league. I mean, you're going to have to beat a, you know, a Kansas again and um, an Oklahoma, a Texas. So there aren't any gimmies that I see. You know, no, Baylor, not at all. Right. That'll be a big challenge, but uh, that'll be a fun tournament to watch. I hope I get a chance to see a few of those games, not just Iowa State's, but there'll be a lot of good basketball played there. Uh, over in Iowa City, the Hawkeyes just can't seem to get you know back on track. Um, they lost their third straight and their fourth out of their last five Sunday at Ohio State. And I don't. I watched that game, and I don't know about you guys, but I just don't see the same energy. I mean, Mike Gasell played incredibly well uh, and incredibly hard in that game, but I just didn't see the same um, energy from some of the other guys. And in particular, I didn't think uh, Utah was very aggressive uh, like he was you know a month ago or even two or three weeks ago. I wonder if they're a little dinged up or if there's some other things going on, but um, what do you guys think about where the Hawkeyes are at well, right now? They're just not playing a complete game. I think the last couple losses, they've been ahead or right at tide with about eight minutes to go. I mean, I guess, uh, was it Ohio State they didn't score the last six minutes or so, or seven minutes? game before that, I think. It was the game Wisconsin. before that. Wisconsin, yeah, so they didn't score you know, for seven minutes. Ohio State, it seemed like it was right there, and then Ohio State pulled away. Teams are just pulling away from them. They're just not finishing the games. Or, and like you said, the energy level doesn't seem... It seems uh, very off right now, and I don't think. And I think that part of, it, and then they're getting frustrated by that fact that they can't 
they haven't been able to do what they've been doing all year, and you can kind of see uh, there's little indecision in them where they haven't had that indecision earlier in the year, and they were really playing well. Tonight, um, you know, they have a big job, too. Uh, they host Indiana, and, and then they finish at Michigan Saturday. But uh, Iowa's now 20-8 and eight, uh, overall, and they're 11-5 and five in the Big Ten. I think Indiana's 13-3 and three maybe in the Big Ten. So uh, Indiana can basically clinch the Big Ten championship tonight. Iowa has to win to even stay uh, alive for a chance to tie for the title. Um, so it's a pretty big game tonight for the Hawkeyes. It really is. And uh, I think a week or so ago I said there's no reason to, to start panicking that, that things will be fine. Well, if you're an Iowa fan, now your, your finger's inching a little closer to the button with every passing game. And, and the pattern, we referred to this a while ago too, the pattern of late season problems is very much there now. It's hard to deny when a team struggles that badly. Uh, Utah, as good as he's been, is, 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 as Nelly implied, has been a little tentative here. He's passing up some shots he should take. Um, you know, the, the depth isn't there as it was in the beginning of the year. And it, again, all these problems are, are fixable, assuming that they're not too tired, and I can't imagine they are. They're fixable, but now they've got to fix them. And they don't have much time. Can they beat Indiana? Sure. But they have to play with more confidence and more aggressiveness than they have in recent weeks. You know, and even more important tonight than, than winning because it keeps them in the uh, hunt for the conference championship. Uh, it's important for them to win because they need some momentum here going into this sure. Big Ten tournament and the postseason beyond that. And you know, going to play at Michigan on uh, uh, Saturday won't be an easy task either. They're one of the better shooting teams in the country, and we all know that uh, defending the three-point shot hasn't always been a strength for the Hawkeyes. So um, back here in Cedar Falls, you and I is rolling. Uh, this has uh, been a really good story to follow the last two months. Um, uh, that was a really good win uh, Saturday at Evansville uh, on their floor against uh, uh, the second best team in the league basically um, on their senior day. So there were a lot of things working against you and I, but they've gone nine and one in their last 10 games. Uh, probably the best record in the Missouri Valley over that stretch, yep. I would guess. So, mm -hmm. uh, to get another 19 and 12 on the season. And then the fourth seed for the MVC tournament with uh, their first game Friday against Southern Illinois. Um, you've been along for the ride, Sully. What, uh, what are your thoughts? Well, it was it, it. You can think back to a couple of weeks ago, and the situation didn't look very good at all. And it seemed like you and I was teetering the brink of playing on the Thursday game. And you know what happens to teams that play have to play four games in four days to to get to the uh, the tournament finals. Now they're they're playing very very well. They've got a lot of things working for them. I mean, obviously the obvious ones. West Washington's playing well. They've done some things offensively. Defensively, they're much sharper than they were. They're rebounding better. Uh, and the bench still isn't long, but it is, it's productive. Uh, both Wyatt Mohaus and Clint Carlson have been very, very good at times off the bench. Carlson made a big impact at the end of that game Saturday with Evansville. And you have to give them credit for being mentally tough. As you suggested, Doug, there are a lot of things working against them uh, Saturday with a win into uh, Evansville. Uh, the Aces had all the, the, the emotional cards, if you will, on, on their side. And yet you and I hung in there, hung in there, and, and when Evansville was made, made runs, they, they fought them off. And, uh, Washburn came up big with a, a, a block shot at the end, and for all the, the publicity that the dunks get, and he gets a lot of publicity for that, it's his defense, his ability to block shots, his ability to play uh, guys one-on-one. -on -one. It's been a big, big difference down the stretch, and uh, to beat Southern Illinois, it's going to have to be a big difference again, because uh, if Anthony Bean is healthy, he can be dangerous. You know, the, you speak, speaking of Anthony Bean and Wes Washburn, it brings me to another um, point of contention or conversation. Um, all conference teams are announced today. Um, Wes Washburn is not on the first team. Anthony Bean is. Um, and to my way of thinking, Wes brings a lot more to the table than Anthony Bean does. He really does. Um, and to explain the, the voting mechanism there, uh, beat reporters are not allowed to vote for their own team. In other words, I couldn't vote for Washburn, Morgan, Bohannon, etc. And, uh, and Todd Hefferman couldn't vote for Anthony Bean. So in the middle or somewhere, I, I, a lot of people voted for Bean over, over Washburn. And I don't have a good answer as to why, except for the fact that he's been good for a while now. He was second leading scorer in the Valley, and he's had some big games. But, but I think that's fair to point out that, that Washman does make a lot of, does impact the game in a lot of ways, and is an all-round a, a better player. Yeah, I, I don't like the way the NBC process works for selecting all-conference teams. I mean, they don't trust you to, to vote for the players that you cover, um, but they trust you to... Uh, vote for other teams' players, and technically, I mean, you could put somebody on there to try to keep Anthony Bean off. I mean, you mm -hmm. could vote for, uh, you know, Reed Timmermans from Drake and uh, instead of Anthony Bean, and 
Uh, so it all plays out the same. I just, I really don't understand the thought process behind that. You've seen you and I play 30 some games this year. Uh, you should be able to vote for the guys you've seen play that many times. Sure. I mean, I'm not going to vote for Ted Freeman for all conference when he played. You have to trust the people that are, that are covering the games. And, and you know, I, I feel when I go through this process, and I've gone through it more with football and basketball, it, it's the same for both, you feel a little hamstrung. Yeah. You have to sit there and scratch your head, well, okay, if I can't vote for this guy, this guy, this guy, who do I vote for? And there are times I feel like I'm literally giving votes away because I can't vote for the people I want to vote for. And it, it, it's tough. And, I don't know that if it affects the outcome much, but you have to believe that it does. I wish those ballots were all made um, public, um, and then we would know if people were, you know, trying to cut corners sure. to to get certain players on the team and keep certain players off and those kind of things. But um, I would guess that we're going to have a coach of the year uh, decision here in the next couple of days in the Missouri Valley too. Um, that hasn't been decided yet, has it? No, that won't be announced. It's been voted upon, but it won't be announced till Thursday. And uh, the general consensus is it's the, the, it'll be between uh, uh, Barry Hinson and Greg Marshall. And uh, I will tell you I voted for Greg Marshall uh, for, this <laughs> for this reason. Uh, oh he, he had to keep the ship together in the beginning of the year when Van Fleet was hurt, when things going, were going so well. A lot of people were saying, well, they may not even make the tournament. And they have. They're, they, I don't know if they're going to make the tournament, but they played well enough to win the conference title. They're the top seed. Um, I'm not sure that Greg Marshall is the most likable guy on the planet, but uh, certainly he gets the job done. With, with Henson, um, you have a situation where people pick Southern Illinois to be in the bottom half, maybe the bottom third of, of the conference. Ninth, I believe. I yeah, and they, are, and they started off great. They are 22 and 9, but they fell off a little bit at the end of the year. But, uh, but he, you know, they are uh, fifth seed in the tournament, tied with you and I for fourth, a, a big turnaround. Uh, can he sustain it after this? I don't know. But I think this year, for one season at least, uh, he's done a remarkable job. Uh, you could make a case for Marty Simmons at Evansville. Yes, I mean, that's but, also true. Uh, he, although he's got two first-team all-conference players in D.J. Valentine and Makovicius. Or, 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 that's or, pretty good, Makovicius. Yeah. Well, that's how it kind of plays out phonetically. But uh, Brian, Gary Ryman on the radio always pronounces it like Moscovich or something. Yeah, Moscovich like or something. It's, it's, it's difficult. But anyway, it's, he's a big guy and he's a real good player. So they've got two first-team all-conference players. Um, I, but I do think that they... Marty did a good job of coaching them to get them uh, where they are, 22 and 9 or whatever mm -hmm. it is. Yeah, second 20 20 plus wins. Yeah. Um, and, uh, you know, you can make a case for Ben Jacobson. Sure. I mean, if you take those top five teams, um, and we didn't talk about Illinois State, but um, Porter Moser did a pretty darn good job with Illinois State this season, too, and mm -hmm. although they are extremely talented. Um, they should be good, but uh, you can make a case for Ben Jacobson um, at UNI. Uh, probably if you look at those top five teams, his depth of talent is probably not as good as those other four. Um, and then, you know, I, I kind of came at this a different way when I was thinking about it uh, yesterday. Which one of those other four coaches, um, Simmons, Mosier, Greg Marshall, um, or Barry Hinson, could take the team that you and I has and get the same amount of production out of them? Could, they, could any of those guys take that UNI team and beat North Carolina, beat Iowa State, uh, and Wichita State's home court winning streak, win at Evansville, and get 19 wins out of them? It's a good question. I, I, I know who I'd say. You wouldn't like the very, my answer, but uh, I think Greg Marshall could do it. I think he, he coaches defense pretty well. Uh, and I think that the, the you and I will respond, the players that you and I have now will respond well to his, his message of toughness. Again, I'm not sure how the personalities would react. We don't know that, but I think just the overall philosophy the character of the team, I, I think it would mesh well enough for a, a UNI team to do the same thing under him that it did under Ben Jacobson. Um, that's, it's interesting that you're, you go that direction. I mean, if I had to pick my top four, I wouldn't even have Marshall in there. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think that that team did what was expected of them. Uh, when they didn't have Fred Van Vliet, they struggled. They got off to a slow start. They lost a lot of games early in the year. When they got him back, they started winning. You know, uh, I, I don't think there's anything special about what he mm -hmm. did this year. Bear argument. Interesting conversation. Nelly, you want to? Yeah, you know, I'm the wrestling the guy, so I'm just learning. <laughs> you can do a tiebreaker vote, though. Yeah. I mean, well, I, I can. You know, when we go back, we go back to the, the all conference. Like I said, this year's the first time I did football, and it was really difficult because I couldn't vote for any Northern Iowa players. And now you're thinking, well, I'm comparing them to DeAndre Hall to this guy, or you know, or this guy to this guy, and I'm like, well, did did DeAndre go to the? Um, he was at the combine, the combine yesterday. I watched him a little bit. Yeah. And how did that go? 
He, he was doing. I, I thought he did well. They talked about him several times. I mean, uh, but you know, you get those guys, and they want to talk about the guys that are from Florida and Alabama, and they don't right. really talk about those guys from the small schools a lot. And, but you know, he's gotten a lot of positive uh, pub. You know, I watched. Uh, I'm gonna forget which is the East West Shrine game he was at, or was it the North South South game? I can't. Whatever yeah, game. Shrine, they talked about him in that game, and they and they wrote. There's some stories that written about him and how he raised his stock. So I think he's still right in that third or fourth round. You know, and. Everybody loves, I, I guess he's got an incredible wingspan of something, which was a whole story apparently somebody did about how long his arms are. Really? And that's how they want, you know, the defensive backs now, guys that can, you know, really with some length. And so, and he, and he, the drills I watched him yesterday, he looked pretty good. And I think he ranked uh, in the top ten on, in a couple of the, I want to say the vertical and the, I can't remember all the drills they do. Maybe the three cone drill, he was like in the top ten. That's times wise. You know, I know I don't know what those have to do with playing football, but you know the, that's what they do every year. <laughs> and so I think he had a, he had a good thing. I'm going to try to get a hold of him th later this week or next week. I got to get I get a hold of his agent and see how he thought the process went and what his feedback was. And I'm looking forward to that conversation. Is he doing the pro day here? No, do you know? DeAndre? And uh, that I don't know. Mm -hmm. And uh, another another thing I got to follow up on. So good to put that out because I almost forgot about that. Uh, well, let's talk about something else you know quite a little bit about the Blackhawks. Um, they're playing better, uh, and PK is like a trader PK these days. I mean, he is wheeling and dealing, and you know, there's kind of two sides to that. It's uh, it's great to try and go out and improve your team, but um, it's also kind of a hard thing for those kids. We're talking about 17, 18, 16, 17, 18 year old yeah. kids that you're basically uprooting in the middle of the school year, uh, sending to another city to uh, play out the rest of the year. Yeah, I believe I believe what it is after a certain time they can't trade any kid that's in high school, or if they can. So right now, the like the one uh, the trade they made last night, which I was surprised. I thought he was done wheeling and dealing, but this deal must have came up uh, and it was too good to pass up. But he, they traded a 20-year-old defenseman last night, and then a, a kid I think is 19, 18 or 19. So I think he's out of school. But but the, yeah, that is they uproot him. Uh, they're all in. I think they're all in. He thought that he had a good team. They just been. So hurt all year long. I think he thought this team at the beginning of the year with who they had, Kale Morris coming back, and the guys, the pieces he had, he thought this team was going to contend for a regular season title. But, man, injury after injury after injury. Two weeks ago, I think, uh, when they played Dubuque uh, home and home a couple weeks, or uh, not this past week, and the weekend before that, it was the first time all year he had had to have a healthy scratch. So that means he was always, you know, there's, I covered a game uh, three weeks ago where they played with uh, seven actual forwards, I think, they had, and they played two defensemen, so they could have nine, three three lines. And that's how banged up they've been. And now they're back. You know, Georgia Slokovic from the, there's another one that's tough, from Latvia, is back. You know, they didn't think they released him. They didn't think he had a torn labor. They didn't think he was coming back. He had the surgery, came back, and he goes, and uh, Pika said he's one tough dude. He's playing, you know. And then, you know, they got Yuri Taro back, who had an upper body injury, and you know it's uh, they're finally there. They made the trade for Garrett Metcalf, and uh, the one thing we can say about this, there seems to be a lot of trades between Waterloo and Madison. Troy Ward at Wisconsin, or Matt, who is the head coach, I think at Madison, is one of PK's really good buddies. So, and he's got a lot of them. He's got a lot of contacts up there. And uh, Shane Fukushima is really the, the associate head coach. Uh, is really the guy that does a lot of that wheeling and dealing for him. And, they're they're all in. They want to play. They got the two. They got Madison's two leading scores at this team. I think they got the puzzles, and we could have, we could see another long run here. Not just their two leading scorers, but the McCormick kid ranks in the top ten in the league. Yeah. Um, so uh, with like forty two points, I mean they got two prolific scores. Yeah. So it really should add a new dimension to to that team offensively. Yeah. I went and watched them play Friday night. The Friday night off, and I, so I went and watched them play, see what they and they played well. I mean they really took it to them, Sioux City and. You know they're they're looking good. They're pl they're firing on all cinders, cylinders. You know they you know it's gonna, interesting. They're going to make a push here late. You know for that West Division, and then you never know what happens in the playoffs. You can get hot at the right time. And I think they got two goalies that can win games for them, and that's where it really starts in the playoffs. Um, interesting, uh, I guess from the other side, um, what does this say about Madison? I mean, have they pretty well written it off? Um yeah, they, they well they they did. I think they've written it off, and the the, the trade that uh, Waterloo made with Sioux City. But I think they got some high draft picks. I know Waterloo with the the trade they made to get their their top defenseman, who's an NHL draft pick. Um, that kid's gonna be back next year for Waterloo, but Waterloo gave up a high draft pick next year for them to get that kid, Jake Re Rescheck. I can't pronounce his last name either. But uh, so and then 
Madison got a couple high picks from Waterloo, so Waterloo might might be, I don't know, maybe they feel comfortable with their futures list right now, and next year's draft isn't as heavy with top-line kids, so they feel that they can maybe give away some of those picks, and uh, they feel comfortable with the guys they're going to have coming back next year, so it's interesting, but uh, yeah, those teams, that you know, they, they might think, okay, we're not going to make the run this year to make the playoffs, so let's see if we can build up and build our team for next year, and you know, it's still all about these kids, you know. Every one of those kids that was traded this week, they're they already signed, they're already committed to Division I schools, or if not, have already signed. So it's, you know, it's pretty much this is for, at this time of the year, they're looking to, to win some games. For one year. Yeah. Um, yeah, it'll be fun to see what happens here down the stretch. Um, but one thing that they, it seems like they've needed some help, some more uh, offensive firepower is with their power play. Um, yeah. They haven't scored a lot of goals uh, on the power play this year, so. Hopefully these new guys can help uh, pick that up a little bit, and uh, we'll see if they make a good run here. Yeah, that's that's a good point because I think they rank near the bottom in both penalty kill and penalty or scoring percentages. Uh, we're also uh, deep into the high school basketball postseason. Girls state tournament is underway. Um, you guys are both uh, been covering sub state boys games. Um, Waverly Shellrock lost a tough one last night. Uh, I guess just uh, give us a few highlights from that one, Nelly. Great game, two of the best prep centers in the state of Iowa last night. You know, Cordell Pemsel, who's going to Iowa for Wallert, and, and then Austin Fife from Waverly Shell Rock, who has got another year left at Waverly, but is going to Northern Ireland. They went, at, they really didn't go at it so much because uh, Waverly was trying to keep uh, Fife out of uh, foul trouble, so they didn't put him on Pemsel, they put Andrew Epley. But a great game. Uh, Waverly led up the first quarter. Wallert made a huge run in the second quarter, led it half, and then they, they pulled away in the third quarter and were up double digits, and then all of a sudden Fife hit a three-pointer from the corner. They set up a play for him, and, you know, Waverly was leading by four or five with two minutes to go, and Waller put a full-court press on him. They turned it over back-to-back. -back. Waller tied the game, and then and then uh, Waverly had a turnover on the other end, and and uh, uh, Waller went ahead and won it, and they pulled it out in the last two minutes. I thought Waverly had it with two minutes to go and up by five, and they were playing so well and under control, and I don't know if the, you know, they... I talked to Nate Stiege after the game. He said we got the ball where we wanted to on the press. We just didn't, you know, we didn't take care of it and uh, and didn't, uh, you know, and, and didn't uh, handle it very well. And so he goes, you know, that that was the diff bottom line. That was the difference in the game. We didn't handle their press very well when it came down to it. On the other hand, uh, we do have several teams that have made it through to the state tournament, and another one that plays tonight, Cedar Falls, um, down in Cedar Rapids. Uh, Sully will bring us up to date, I guess, on uh, some of those games. Well, starting with Cedar Falls, they play Linmar tonight in the, in the U.S. Cellular Center in Cedar Rapids. It's the second time, I believe, they've met. Linmar won the first one. Uh, it's interesting. I was talking to someone about that game yesterday, and they pointed out, <clears throat> we'll see how Cedar Falls handles that environment, and uh, specifically the Cellular Center. Linmar uh, is a little bit more experienced, I think, in this sort of thing. They've, they've been down there more often. This particular group of Tigers doesn't have that sub-state final experience. Um, they're, they're pretty young yet. You know, two of the key rotation members are sophomores. And Trey Hahn Fagan hasn't been this far, I don't think. So we'll see. We'll see what happens. I, I give Cedar Falls a pretty good shot. I think that they're going to give Linmar a good game. I, I don't. I wouldn't be surprised at least if the, the Tigers won. Uh, as for the rest of it, we have um, uh, several teams in North Iowa Cedar League in the tournament this year, and two of them play one another first round. Jessup Gladbeck, Rhinebeck. Interestingly enough, they did not play in the regular season. They're on opposite ends of the North Iowa Cedar League. And, and did not play, but uh, both are high caliber teams. Both have played great all year. Gladbrook Rhinebeck has Joe Smolt, uh, one of the best guards in the state, certainly maybe, perhaps the best in his class. Uh, if you look at their numbers, he's scoring 25 points a game, the rest of them are under 10. And, and so it's, it, it's, it's got to be Joe Smolt or pretty much nobody else for them. Uh, you have um, Jessup, that's a balanced team going for the first time to state since 1999. Uh, Joe Spines is the head coach there. His first, it will be his first trip to state as a head coach. Uh, Dyke New Hartford unbeaten, 25 and 0, first time since 2013, and and the Wolverines have basically their entire rotation back from a year ago. And in talking to Greg Moore about that, he says he thinks they're better defensively than they were a year ago. He also thinks that this team pushes the ball better uh, in transition. They have uh, they have a point guard Connor Newroth who's good at that. They're not big, but I think they're all willing to to, to do the dirty work under the boards. They play uh, Pella Christian in the first round, and Pella Christian is the AC, which means absolutely nothing. Uh, Pella Christian is, is a good team. A year ago, it, it beat uh, Knox Hole Western Christian out of the tournament and then beat AP in the Constellation game. So it's going to be, uh, there's going to be some interesting matchups down in those particular classes, and our area teams are right in the middle of it. 
I, I really, I really find interest about the Jessup as they lost their leading score from last year in like game one or preseason. He tore his ACL and they didn't really miss a, too much of a beat this year. So yeah. Right. And also, I think I believe graduated there. I think they have an old state point guard. I can't remember his name, uh, unfortunately, who uh, is gone. And yet they they overcame that too. So it's a, a good story there on Jessup. You know, Jessup and Dagna Hartford kind of remind me of um, each other. I mean, just looking at box scores all year. Uh, they both, neither one has a guy like Joe Smold who scores 25 a right, game, right. basically. I mean, there's, the scoring goes 7, 8, 10 players deep, and um, they win with pretty good defense. Right. So. And we should not forget about Osage, the Green Devils are in. I think, I believe this is the first time since 95, I haven't looked that up yet, but uh, they, uh, they have, they've had a good year. They lost twice to West Fork. That's a, not exactly a disgrace. West Fork was awfully good, but uh, they're in the tournament, they're in the same bracket as Lake New Hartford, so we could have that semifinal matchup if both win. Very good. Should be an exciting week at the Boys' Day Tournament I would think well. so. We better wrap it up for today. Um, as always, you can stay on top of all the local and area sports action in our print editions or at wcfcourier.com. And uh, we'll be back next week.